Hi, it's John, and thanks for joining me again. I'm uh, pleased to be joined today by a really fascinating author and mathematician, David Orrell, who is the author of Quantum Economics. Thanks for joining me today, David. Hi, John. Thanks for having me on. Nice to be here. Um, you have a very interesting background, so I thought we would start slow before we get into the heavy stuff and uh, just give you a chance to introduce yourself and what you've done with your career up until now. Okay, well, um, I'm an applied mathematician by training, so I studied at the University of Alberta. And then um, I actually worked on particle, got, went to work for an engineering firm that was building a particle accelerator. Uh, so I worked in that area for um, a few months, a few years, sorry. And then I worked, um, I ended up uh, working at the Superconducting Super Collider, which is this uh, lab that you might have heard of back in the 90s that was, uh, you know, it was going to be this huge thing. It was a bit like the uh, CERN, the Large Hadron Collider they have there in Switzerland but um, even bigger. And unfortunately, it got killed by the government kind of around 1995. So, you know, I, I was looking around for something else. I ended up going back to university. I did a PhD and um, I got interested in like nonlinear dynamics and chaos. And so my thesis was on that, applied to weather forecasting. And just but generally, you know, com prediction of complex nonlinear systems. And so I... Uh, worked in computational biology, which of course is sort of ultimate example perhaps of that. And I uh, still so I do consulting now in that area, and I also write books on science and economics. I uh, I want to get into your your books in just a moment, but before I do that, maybe you could just uh, give us some baby steps into what it is that that this is really all about. Can you explain what it is that economics uh, has to do with things like genetics and the weather? What it, what is at the core of your work? Yeah, well, they yeah, so they. They seem kind of unrelated in a way, but they're all examples of uh, nonlinear complex organic systems, you know. So we don't, so, you know, uh, genetics obviously is like this, you know, a very, very complex system where it's very hard to kind of predict the outcome just from knowing about the genes and so on, you know. So you, reductionist models don't really work all that well. The weather system, climate, we don't really think of that maybe as being an organic system, but actually. You know, the thing which distinguishes, like James Lovelock showed, you know, things which distinguish this kind of living planets from dead planets is the fact that, you know, living plants have an atmosphere. It's all created by life forces, you know, respiration of plants, animals, and all this kind of thing is what creates it. So it's, so that's, that's like another organic system. And it has properties which are kind of similar to a biological system because of that. And then the economy, of course, is a... Uh, you know, that's that's got, you know, sentient creatures driving the whole thing. So, but it's another example of a complex system, which is very hard to predict for rather similar reasons. It's interesting. I had my first job years ago working in a genetics lab studying uh, fragile X and autism spectrum disorders in, in at Queen's University in, in Canada. And mm -hmm. uh, the, the idea of genetics was a little bit too complicated for me, at least in terms of where my interests seemed to lie. And I ended up going into finance. Uh, and it was uh, some years later, I was actually studying for the chartered finance analyst designation, which is very much an um, exercise in studying applications, which very quickly have been uh, automated, I think, in large part. Um, and what I actually found an even more interesting experience than that was in parallel, I found Peter Bernstein's books. Uh, one of them was Against the Gods. He's also written a pair on uh, capital ideas and capital ideas evolving. And so I was really interesting to see some of your early work, in particular, Apollo's Arrow, uh, around the science of prediction, because that's really at the heart of the, the economic engine and, uh, and the financial industry. So could you tell us a little bit more about what you looked at in that book? Yeah, so, so that book, it kind of grew out of my thesis, my, my PhD thesis, which is about, uh, you know, prediction of uh, in, in weather forecasting. And, and the thing there is that um, at the time, the story was that uh, prediction error was caused by the butterfly effect, you know, this idea that a butterfly flapping its wings can cause a storm on the other side of the world. And obviously, if a system is so sensitive to initial condition, that makes it very hard to make accurate predictions. So the idea was that what you had to do was do these ensemble forecasts where you do lots of kind of perturbed forecasts from perturbed initial conditions and sort of look at the average. And But I, I came into this, you know, because I had been working in engineering, right, where I kind of know that it's incredibly hard to build a perfect model of an engineered system, let alone, you know, because of all the errors that come in, let alone a natural system like the weather. So I, I just sort of thought this was strange. Like they actually had like a a perfect model hypothesis, which was that, you know, when you're kind of analyzing the weather, just assume that the, the model is perfect, but everything is, is due to, you know, errors due to chaos. So, um, 
So that got me interested in this whole thing about looking at model error, basically, and and how that affects prediction. And so um, Apollo's arrow kind of followed that through. So I looked at why you know the weather is such a hard system to predict. Why it's hard to predict? Like the butterfly effect is kind of is there, but it's kind of down on the noise. I mean, you know, when you think about it, um, it's you know think about the butterfly effect. Think, sort of think like what happens when you kind of wave your hand in the air. Yes, it causes this little perturbation in the air, but is that going to like ripple out and cascade through the you know the global weather system and create a storm? I, you know, no, because what what happens is friction. You have frictional effects, and it kind of dies out. You know, so the weather is is the the atmosphere is sensitive to initial condition, but it's not that sensitive, and it's kind of down in the noise compared to problems due to model error. So. You know, it's the same with uh, genetic prediction. I mean, you know, like this this idea that you have some genes that can have a one effect in one situation and sort of a totally different effect in a slightly different situation. That's because all the effects are you have these complex feedback loops going back back and forth between them, which are very hard to model. Um, so, so I was, you know, I was writing this book, and then I thought, okay, I should have like a section on the economy, obviously, because that's you know, as, as you say, that's a very important. Uh, application of prediction these days and so that's really what got me into it and it was kind of it was a bit of a mystery going looking at the way we predict the economy because there's sort of this analog of the butterfly effect called you know the efficient market hypothesis so the butterfly effect said all the air is due to like you know because we have this incredibly magically sensitive system the efficient market hypothesis says we have this magically sensitive system which automatically adjusts everything you know to the actual you know the correct price and so on but in either case we can still make kind of these statistical forecasts and um but yeah so that's you know that's kind of what, what got me got me inter interested in economics was just kind of looking at how we do prediction in that area and um speaking of economics and and a bit of history for a moment when you look as a mathematician at the advancement of economics uh, along with uh, the advancement of let's say enlightened mathematics um where do you see let's say two or three of the key inflection points and we'll get back to maybe one that we might be at now a little bit later on um you, you mean in, inflections in uh, in economics or, or more in like the, the sort of history of economics or you know, the history of the economy? Yeah. What were, what were some key thoughts from the mathematical world that really influenced the way the economic world has worked in your opinion? Um, well, I, I, I guess I, the, you know, the big one would obviously be the invention of money, which, uh, you know, so, and I'm, I'm not talking about just coin money, but kind of going back, you know, like, you know, 4,000 more years ago to ancient Mesopotamia when they have the, um, so uh, money was invented kind of around the same time as mathematics was invented and writing was invented. And it's, and it's believed that these things were largely used actually by accountants, you know, so uh, for kind of keeping track of expenses and so on. So um, it's a whole other side to the profession, really, you know, like they've got a lot to thank for. Um, and so the um, money it kind of started off as this symbolic, as a symbolic thing. It was like a mathematical symbol, really. And and uh, so the amounts would be recorded on these clay tablets, and they referred to shekels, which was a weight of silver, but they were more kind of like a pointer to a silver, you know, because they weren't, you know, you can kind of go in and kind of cash them in for silver because that, you know, the silver is kind of kept in some temple. Um, and so this was the idea of like money as a symbol. Um, with with the invention of um, coin money, it kind of, I think the int very interesting thing about money is that it's kind of switched back and forth between these two sides. It's got kind of a virtual symbol side and it's got like a real side of some kind of material that has real value. So with gold coins, silver coins, electrum actually started off with um you know the the value of money was was in the in the coin itself um the other so you kind of see this through through history i think like another uh example of like mathematicians in particular <laughs> getting involved in the economy would of course be john law in in the early 1700s so he was a scottish mathematician who he was actually wanted for murder that he he committed and he 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 fled to Europe and he ended up in France and somehow or other was in the position to advise the 
um, the the throne on you know setting up a new monetary system, and he kind of pumped this idea of um, uh, well, he 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 started his own bank, and he kind of uh, switched from a gold backed you know currency to a fiat currency, just by sort of, and it wasn't like announced in a big way, you know, it was just kind of like oh by the way these notes are no longer exchangeable for gold, but you know they you but you can buy shares in the Mississippi Company, you know, which was this kind of claim on gold and other things in, in, in the Mississippi Basin area. Um, the only problem was all that gold didn't actually exist, right? So it was just kind of, you know, a claim on a, on a dream. And it turned John Law into like the richest man in the world for like, uh, uh, you know, a year or something. And then the whole thing fell apart. And then around the same time, another mathematician, physicist, Isaac Newton, across the channel, he was... Um, you know, he had, he he was he'd switched from physics and he was working at the Bank of England. He was master of the mint, and one of his jobs was balancing uh, because England was in this bimetallic system, so they had like gold coins and silver coins, and you had to like be careful carefully sort of judge the relative price of these two things. He kind of undervalued the silver coins a little bit, with the result that they all sort of started, you know, being melted down, and it ended up that gold just sort of, you know, became the main, gold coins became the main currency. So England kind of went by accident onto the a kind of a gold standard, which eventually became the international gold standard. And it was funny because the, the you know, the currency is the pound sterling. And this refers, you know, this is a gold standard, but sterling refers to a weight of silver. So it's kind of points to the, um, you know, the kind of, uh, ill-defined nature, you know, it's, it's sort of like, yeah, it's backed by metal, but it's actually named after the wrong metal, right? Yeah. So it's always interesting when the mathematicians kind of get involved in finance, you know, all sorts of strange things happen. Absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned Isaac Newton's role at the Mint there, because I, uh, I've i always been a big fan of him and, and a big fan of money. And I often forget, but it always struck me when I was uh, visiting Threadneedle Street to to learn of that connection and, and the intimate history of money and engineering. Uh, mathematics at the core of it. Um, one of your other books was a uh, really great title, Economists. Uh, and I thought uh, that would be something that would be an interesting turning point here. What are some of the things that you think um, the economics profession or philosophy around economics gets wrong? Yeah. So uh, Economists, what, that, so that was written like after the financial crisis, you know, and, and so everyone was kind of a bit annoyed with all the whole economics thing because, of the, because it was the ultimate example of the sort of failures to predict this, you know, um, complex system, I suppose. And um, so, so economists, what it did was it had like these 10 different things which kind of related to the core principles of economics. Um, so they were, you know, ideas to do with our rationality, the focus on equilibrium, the lack of real interest in power relationships, uh, disengagement with the environment and, you know, and, 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 and all these things. And it was it was written really from the perspective of an applied mathematician. So I was looking at the, uh, the kind of the core models and saying how these don't, you know, engage with these things. So like, you know, one of the most basic, perhaps, is the emphasis on on equilibrium. So you see that with the general equilibrium models used by macroeconomists, and you see it with the efficient market hypothesis. Um, and then I, I kind of revisited the topic uh, like a, just a few years ago, and I did like a, a revised version of the book, and it was 11 ways economists guess it wrong. So I sort of thought of another way. And the, the other way was the one that kind of pulled the others together. And it's sort of weird that I didn't pick up on it. I mean, I picked up on it to a degree in the first book, but it was just that money is like no was was not being properly you know engaged with anywhere in economics you know it's and it's such a strange thing right when you think like if if uh, you you would think uh, if you ask a child you know what is economics about they would probably say well it's about money you know <laughs> but but actually it, it's not you know and and so when you look at the properties of money you see yeah it doesn't fit any economics because it doesn't fit with any of these core assumptions that are in economics. Could you say a few more words about the the error around equilibrium? I'm curious about that. Yeah, so the so if you, if you look at um, uh, general equilibrium models that are used to model the macro economy, right? So so what these what these do? So this kind of goes back to um, work 
from you know the 1950s where, where basically they used game theory uh, result in order to say that if you have free markets they automatically uh, lead to an optimal Pareto optimal is kind of a technical kind of optimality equilibrium um, where basically you can't change anything without making at least one person worse off you know so was, and and this was like a very useful result because this was in the uh the post war kind of cold war type era and it was kind of this idea that you know the capitalist system will achieve an optimal outcome right um and and this idea from equilibrium so you know you can trace it all the way back to adam smith with the invisible hand the invisible hand says that supply and demand come into balance and you get this optimal price which reflects the intrinsic value of whatever it is you know and and, and then it continued in into it fed into the efficient market hypothesis which is that equilibrium is achieved by markets uh, instantaneously um which is which is truly a sort of a magical thing like if, if you think of you know and if you know anyone with experience in engineering for example knows that you can't achieve equilibrium instantaneously it kind of takes a little little while right like if you had a if you have a door that has a spring on it you can try to make it shut quickly and efficiently but you can't make it snap back you know immediately and, and to sort of say that we as humans have um achieved this remarkable feat in, in the financial market seems a bit of a stretch right you know uh, so 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 this so equilibrium seems to be kind of the core thing that runs all the way through economics and it's 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 odd because when you look at the other, like, you know, I mentioned in, you know, other similar systems, like biological systems, the weather system, you know, equilibrium wouldn't, you know, the only living systems which are at equilibrium are dead, right? So it doesn't really work. Uh, good point to end on. The only uh, systems in equilibrium are dead. Um, there's obviously a lot of things that economics does a pretty good job at. Um, but as the uh, cliche says, and I guess many children would also know, as you pointed out, they have some wisdom. Uh, money makes the world go round. And uh, there's a lot of talk these days about doing system upgrades, whether it's on your iPhone or to the airline industry, or, or as we're talking today to the core ideas around money. Um, what are what are some of the thoughts that you have around why it's time to upgrade things now? Again, coming at economics from an applied math point of view, you, you see that a lot of the, the mathematical ideas are, are these sort of equilibrium based things, which are kind of, they're often called Newtonian, but they're not actually Newtonian because the Newtonian physics, you have masses and you have acceleration and inertia and and something like the efficient market hypothesis there's no mass there's no inertia because things change instantly right so there's no resistance to change and the actual um the, only, the the kind of closest thing to that is aristotelian physics right which which said that things seek their own level they seek their own equilibrium and they would do so instantly in a vacuum and therefore, he saw he thought a vacuum couldn't exist. But you know, with the efficient, like saying, yeah, you can actually do that. Economics is based on this very kind of this this very sort of old mindset, and it seems completely out of touch with, you know, even you know, not even modern physics, but just kind of like relatively modern stuff. So it's it, it needs this upgrade, and I think the reason it hasn't happened. So there are lots of things that have kind of been coming into economics over you know the last sort of few decades so for example behavioral approaches which say that yeah we're not perfectly rational i mean equilibrium is kind of tied up with the concept of rationality right the idea that we can kind of reach this optimum balance and behavioral economists they kind of push towards the idea that we're not perfectly rational and so we can't make perfect uh decisions and so that equilibrium is going to be more difficult to achieve um uh, complexity ideas. So, you know, people have been using ideas from agent based models say that there's no, like in mainstream economics, they sort of tend to think of a homogeneous consumer, you know, who's kind of like lumps together, you know, all the consumers in the world. And, and agent based models say, well, no, actually, people are different and you need to kind of take that into account. And so you end up with these more, more complex or systems dynamics ideas have been feeding into economics. So the idea that uh, you know, it's a dynamic system that changes in time. It's, it's not equilibrium. And the problem is that economics, so it kind of brings these ideas, but it's always done as kind of perturbations to this main equilibrium model. So the idea, I guess, repeated a lot is that you start with this equilibrium model 
and then you add these frictions or you add these little effects, you know, to make it more realistic. But that's not that's not enough. I mean, it's like if you you know again, if you had a model of a, a human being and you said, well, everything's at equilibrium, but there are some little frictions, you know, like there are the lungs, which is a friction, and the heart, which is a friction, and you know, you wouldn't get very far, right? And so, I think with with economics, you need to you can't you can't kind of reform it gradually. You actually need to kind of jump, and it is like jumping to a new to a new operating system where you kind of discard all of the stuff about, you know, rationality should not be your starting point. I mean, you know, you go all the, the news about, you know, like the GameStop saga or whatever, or uh, the, the, the news in the markets today, you know, your starting point doesn't have to be that, you know, investors are rational. It's, it's you know, rationality is maybe like half of it or, or something. I don't know, but, you know, it's kind of there's a lot of other stuff going on. So you kind of, yeah, you just need to start again. We uh, had a similar discussion yesterday with a gentleman named Hayden Shaughnessy, who's an expert in uh, digital transformation. And he talks about a very similar idea about embracing irrationality. And I think there's a lot of connection to the whole idea of continuous innovation and and how do things flow in a more authentic way. Um so with that kind of basis, can you say uh, a few things just to get us started on the ideas that you, you talk about in your latest book, Quantum Economics? Because I think that's really where the most interesting insights are. Um, yeah, so qu quantum economics, um, so I, I think like, quite often, you know, when we, when we hear the word quantum, we immediately start thinking about, you know, all this kind of mysterious, crazy stuff from physics where something can jump from one place to another, or you can have... You know, Schrodinger's cat can be alive and dead at the same time, and you have this impenetrable mathematics, and there's always this idea that it's you know mysterious and magical and so on. But um, for the the sort of purposes of economics, the the main kind of quantum idea has got to do with quantum probability, which is actually very simple. And you you can think of it as as something like let's say that you're you're thinking about a coin toss. Okay, so in a in a classical probability you would say okay there's a um, let's say a 50 percent chance of if it's balanced 50 percent chance of heads and for 50 percent chance of heads but so but let's imagine that you you want to actually model or you know kind of present this the state of this coin where you don't know what's going to happen so one way to do that would be to sort of you got two dimensions so you uh, you could say like one dimension is going to be tails and one dimension is going to be heads, and you just have a diagonal line, right? And and you say the projection onto the horizontal axis is going to tell you about the probability of tails, and the projection onto the vertical axis is going to be the probability of heads. And so then you could imagine if you tilt this, it will change the probability of heads and tails. And because you want the probabilities to add to one, you say you're going to take the square of this, as the probability of tails, the square of this is the probability of heads, and they add to one because it's that's Pythagorean theorem, you know. Like so, so that that would be a reasonable way, right, of of picturing a coin toss. And I, I don't think there's kind of a simpler way to do it, which captures this idea that we don't know what's going to happen. But as soon as you do that, that's that's basically that kind of leads to everything else because one thing is that you can imagine rotating this around like if it was pointing straight up it would say there's a hundred percent chance of heads zero percent chance of tails but you could go over here you could flip it over the other side so there's like a negative projection onto the horizontal like a negative probability the the size of that probability you square it it's still the same you know it's so it's still giving you sensible answers but you got a negative number sneaking in there just from this like 2d representation when you do that that means if you start adding probabilities before you take the norm, they can cancel. In quantum uh, mechanics, that's called interference. Okay, and when you think about now, imagine that you've got like two coins. So now you've got like possibility of heads and tails, and one heads and tails on the other. That's four different possibilities, four axes to draw it. But you could imagine a situation where the coins are linked in some way. So like if one is heads, the other's heads. If one is tails, the other's tails. And that's called entanglement. And, and all of this just came out of uh, drawing the, a coin toss. There's nothing about physics, you know. Uh, it, it's just it's, it's the next simplest kind of probability. But it brings in these, these concepts of 
interference and entanglement. So, so when you think about if you want to model the economy, you want to model like human decision making. One thing that we know about in human decision making, and this is something that has been amply demonstrated by you know behavioral economists and so on, is that you get mental interference, like concepts kind of cancel out in our minds. You know, things it can they don't add together in kind of like the normal way sometimes. So, so that can be modeled and, and entanglement. Uh, if you think of you know people where entangled with the ideas of other people um we're also entangled through things like in finance through something like a loan you know if you think of the loan contract as a separate entity and you know you got like a debtor and a creditor that's an entangled that you can model that on a quantum computer with a very simple circuit so these are all things that are easily expressed using the language of quantum probability and quantum computing. I'm uh, hoping you can later uh, help me settle a question I have about quantum and its implications for cryptography, but we'll get to that in just a second. Um, before we do, uh, I wanted to ask, there's some pretty fundamental ideas in economics, uh, especially when it comes to monetary theory, when you look at uh, the idea, for example, embedded growth and interest rates and things like that. Um, you look at uh, the topic of scarcity in your book, and I thought maybe that would be worth spending a moment just to explain a bit more. The interesting thing in, is that uh, economics is traditionally defined as being about scarcity, but um, you know, when you, when you think about how we assign our scarce resources, uh, money is part of it. But you know, again, if you did this thing of like asking someone who kind of was a visitor to our planet and didn't know too much, they would probably say that it seems that the way we allocate scarce resources is through power, you know, and it's, it's, it's not like money is kind of, money is a manifestation of, of power, but it's like the power, which is really driving it in the end, right? I mean, you know, so um, power is something that has been missing. So that was one of the things in, you know, Economist was a chapter of the thing that power doesn't really appear. And so it's interesting because, um, when you don't talk about power, that allows for the abuse of power, right? So power plays a very strong role, obviously, in finance, it plays a very strong role in economics. I mean, I want, you know, one reason that uh, economic theory has persisted for as long as it has is because it has a very nice story for the financial sector, right? Which is that, you know, markets are efficient by investing, you know, correctly in finance, you're improving efficiency you're actually working for the system uh you can calculate risk based on you know these uh, uh, uh complicated mathematical formulas for things like complex derivatives and whatnot you can sell those you can you know you can make a lot of money so um basically there's a lot of uh there's a very sort of in, a, a, a bit of an incestuous relationship if you like between economics and the financial sector you know so power plays a huge role in economics, but, you know, it's not there in the math. It's not there. I mean, somebody did a word um, analysis of economics textbooks uh, recently, and, and the one main conclusion was that words that were related to things like around power were sort of absent or, you know, compared to like normal books. You know, they just didn't really want to talk about it. So, um, so, so yeah, so I think like the quantum approach, that one thing about it is that it because it views the economy not as a sort of magical equilibrium system, but as something that is kind of driven by um, subjective by subjective forces, but also by coercion, right? So if you, let's say that you think of a like a um, you think about money. Um, so we normally think of money as this kind of uh, inert substance, but um, like one of the uh, longer lasting forms of money actually was these uh, tally sticks, which they used in, in medieval England. And so this was something where like the sovereign would uh, say, okay, I want to collect a, a tax. And so they would take a stick and they would uh, mark it with the amount that was owed in tax. And then they would split it down the middle and they would keep one part, which was the stock. And that was the kind of the good part. And the other person would get the, the stub, which was kind of the, the part which meant they had to pay back this debt, right? And then when they when it was returned, then they would join the two and, and you know just dis destroy them. Um, 
So, so that was a form of money because the stock was a right, right to collect a debt and that could be traded, you know? So if the sovereign didn't want to wait to collect the debt, they could sell that stock on to somebody else who could sell it on. And so these things ended up circulating as money. And this is like a very normal thing in, in, in money, you know, it's kind of one of the ways it works. But when you look at that relationship, what is giving money that value? It's not, it's not like some inert thing. It's a sovereign telling someone else that they have to pay, right? So it's, it's directly, it's an expression of power, it's directly related to, to power. So power is like at the heart of money. And you know the quant so the quantum approach. The nice thing about it is because it it offers a framework for kind of bringing in this sort of the subject. So you can that power can be expressed in a kind of like um, uh, again as a as a quantum circuit as something that requires energy to happen. It has to be done. So it gives you kind of a framework for discussing this kind of thing. At least there's a couple of big technologies that are talking about disrupting financial services um, at the same time as quantum technology is developing in the background. Uh, I was wondering if you can share some thoughts first on um, digital currencies in particular. I, I think yeah, going going back to you know the sort of the history of money and how it's split between the sort of virtual sides and the real sides. I think like the um, cryptocurrencies are another really interesting step in the evolution of money. And we have these we have these sort of two main theories of money. One is that it's a symbol. And, you know, so that was called chartalism for a while. And now it kind of feeds into things like mon modern mon monetary theory or bullionism, which sees it as this sort of object. Um, and it's a bit like the, the old debate in physics about whether light was a wave or a particle, right? You know, and it had properties of both it, but then it was eventually shown that it was it was actually both at the same time. It was a, it had properties of a wave and of a particle. And I think money is like that. And something like Bitcoin, on one hand, it's like the ultimate example of a virtual currency because you know no one's you can't really see it. But on the other hand, it's actually rather like gold in the sense that there's only a limited number of these things available, and it takes a lot of energy to mine. You know, so it's kind of um, it's, it's it's a really good example of how money has these sort of properties and they. They don't fit in to either of the kind of classical theories because Bitcoin, like if, if you take something like chartalism, it says that money is something that's produced by the government and it gets its value because we can claim it back in taxes, you know, and so that's so it's just kind of an accounting thing. But Bitcoin doesn't fit into that because it's not, you know, the governments don't like it. Um, and it's it doesn't fit into the bullionism theory either because it's virtual. So this is like one of the kind of, you know, uh, inspirations in a way for getting into this um, quantum view, which, which is that basically it doesn't fit into either of the, the classical theories. You need you need something new, which is this idea that value can kind of be booted up out of out of the void, uh, a bit like, you know, particles are all the time, right? Yeah, it's an interesting analogy to, to you think of it as particles. Um, the other topic that we spend a lot of time on here is artificial intelligence. And I was wondering if you have any thoughts on how that fits into the landscape uh, that we're describing, especially from an economics perspective. I think my, my main thought about that, I guess, is that artificial intelligence has, um, I mean, it's, it's used a lot also in uh, feeding into areas like, you know, biology, uh, pharmaceuticals, and, and, you know, this kind of area. So I see it kind of being used a lot in these applications. And, and obviously it's used a lot in um, in finance for, you know, picking out trends and in, in, in data and so on. Um, but it seems, you know, it seems like it's one of these things where it's very good at certain tasks and it's, it's not so good at, at, at other tasks, right? But I do kind of wonder how things will change if we see the, the widespread availability of quantum computers, because these do work in a uh, you know in a fundamentally different way, they, they, basically the the possible kind of space that they can uh, that they can look at this sort of, and and the kind of algorithms that they can run will be uh, completely different, right? It's going to be like a, another level. So I think you know I mean there are even you know some people they think they they see the connection between quantum processes and, and consciousness and they even you know wonder if we're going to create some kind of you know living brain so i i don't know about that but i think like it's going to be uh certainly something to watch right yeah we uh we've 
touched on the edge of consciousness with a few of our discussions. We, we spoke with a, a philosopher on this subject recently. Um, but I wanted to spend uh, a second just talking about quantum computing and its implications for cri- cryptography. Do you see that as any kind of a, a cybersecurity threat or, or you know, a, a, a ghost key to get past uh, the benefits that are promised by cryptography? Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I, I guess that's um, that's that's one thing that uh, you know when when people talk about the implications of quantum computing on on society, that's one of the main ones, right? Which is that all these sort of cryptographic uh, methods aren't going to work quite as as well as they used to. Which means that presumably that um, you know we're going to have to like uh, upgrade uh, cryptography in a completely new a new way. It's going to be, uh, yeah, that's going to be quite a task. That seems to be a bit off in the distance at the moment, right? Because it's, it's so hard to, you know, we talked about prediction. It's so hard to kind of predict how these things are going to evolve. I mean, some things they seem to be kind of at the, at this, like, for example, the uh, nuclear fusion, you, you know, you, you, it's, it's this technology that's been promising to, it's either going to give us like an infinite amount of free energy or it's basically, or it's not, you know, it's, it's kind of, so we don't know whether we're going to be able to like get over that threshold. I, I, I would think in my, my guess is that in, in quantum computing, it will happen. But I think before, even through before that happens, there's going to be devices, there's going to be things that kind of run bits of quantum algorithms, which are in themselves are going to do a lot to change things, especially in something like finance, you know, where the um, you know, there's, there's, there's always sort of like a race on, right, for the next technology. Another sort of oddball question I had is, I don't know if you've paid attention at all to what's going on in ESG and some of the ideas about the double X, uh, or sorry, not double X, the, uh, that's important as well, but the double bottom line economy. Um, I remember studying uh, actually at Oxford as well under some interesting people talking about measuring performance. And uh, a lot of ideas in economics come from, as I understand it, uh, John Maynard Keynes and how do you uh, rebuild economies after world wars. And at the time, there was a lot more crude to, or there were a lot less sophisticated tools in terms of measuring what types of values were being created by activities. Um, do you see that as something else that fits into the quantum perspective of the future of money in the economy? You mean like, like ways of me- as alternatives to GDP or something like that? Yeah, an or alternative is- to GDP, money that measures more than just, let's say, a quantitative value of something, maybe less tangible things as well? Sure, yeah. Yeah, I, definitely, because it... Um, one one thing about you know the, the I guess the quantum perspective is it's is, is saying that we have this idea of value which is uh, sort of this sort of fuzzy loose thing. So if you imagine if you think like the value of something like uh, you know just sort of any any object in your in your life that uh, you, you sort of think it's it's actually very hard to pin down. You know you have this kind of fuzzy idea, and it's only when you actually do a transaction that you kind of collapse it down to some some hard number. So again, it's like the measurement procedure that, that, that you see in physics. So part of it, when you think about the economy, what it's doing is it's basically collapsing everything down all the time to a, to a number, uh, kind of a score, which has kind of, you know, is good in some ways. And this was one of the great things about the invention of money was that kind of, you know, created all this sort of capacity for, you know, doing all sorts of things. But at the same time, it's, it's, it's a bit negative because it kind of creates this rather artificial metric that we all sort of obsess about, right? So something like GDP, for example. GDP, I, for me, the, the closest thing that it corresponds to is, is energy burn, actually. You know, it's kind of like how quickly are we moving stuff around and digging stuff up and moving it around and, and, and then, you know, creating pollution and whatnot. You know, like the more of that you do, the more GDP you have. So it's a great measure of that. But... At a time when, you know, we are kind of, uh, you know, going off into like all different kinds of environmental crises and, you know, the, the, the human energy and activity is having so much impact on the planet. You kind of think like, you know, this, this is not, maybe, maybe this is not the right metric to be looking at how much energy can we use and generate, right? So, so yeah, definitely. And I think one, one thing to do perhaps is to, you know, part of this has been driven by this sort of idea from economics that these numbers are are real, that they're measuring intrinsic value, and 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 they're not. You know, they they kind of misprice things horribly. It's not like um, it's it's not like some sort of nudge where we need to, 
you know, re recalibrate things and give a little bit more weight to the climate or something like that is where we, we have to like, you know, really rethink things, um, you know, more fundamentally. Um, I, th I think like, um, you know, one thing that kind of came out of this, uh, the coronavirus uh, lockdowns that have been going on is both how much control we have in a way to kind of stop things when we think they're harmful, right? And also sort of how completely made up a lot of the economy is, you know? I mean, you know, how is it like, you know, asset prices are going through the roof or whatever as, you know, there's tons of unemployment and activity is just completely slowed. So it just sort of, I think in a way, it kind of frees up the mind for thinking about different kinds of value, thinking that, um, if you have a crisis like the like the environment, what um, you know, what what can we what can we do uh, that that's much more radical and maybe we would have thought about even just a few years ago in order to in order to help it. Well, we'll avoid going down any big rabbit holes today, but it's interesting that you talked about loosening up perspectives, and I, I totally agree how COVID has impacted that. Um, I uh, I wanted to s spend just a moment talking about uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. Do you think there are any uh, words of advice you can share for people who are uh, focused on this space and thinking differently? What, I was thinking that a, a little bit that it, it relates to this idea of being kind of open-minded and not being... Um, I, yeah, I read something a while ago, and it was about comparing different startup scenes. And they were saying like, one reason the startup scene works really well in uh, places like Silicon Valley and whatnot is that you have a lot of people who are kind of, um, they, they worked in startups themselves and they, they kind of, they don't, they, they're kind of open, you know, they don't sort of insist on milestones and whatnot, right? Because they know that there's not really much point. And if you have- Non-linear non types of thinkers, I guess we could say, right? Yeah, yeah, and and so and one reason one reason like we have a kind of a startup scene here in Canada, but I, I don't. You know, this person was kind of criticizing because they were they were saying that it's it's like the the people who are doing it are kind of more from like uh, sort of a banking you know or whatever background, and they they always want milestones you know, and they want to kind of measure everything you know, and they want to say you know okay you have to meet this goal and then this goal and then this goal and then you'll get more money, and you know the the idea is that it's a bit like this idea of kind of collapsing, you know, your sense of value down all the time, like kind of scoring everything all the time. And that can actually kind of kill it. Like sometimes you just need to like, you know, be more open, right. And just kind of take wild risks. I mean, um, it, you know, if, if you have somebody like, you know, Van Gogh, right. You know, he, he, I think he famously was only supposed to have sold like one painting or something like that, or, you know, maybe a bit more than that, but in his life, you know, so if someone had been kind of measuring his output and saying, well, you know, I don't think this is going too well because you haven't sold enough paintings this year. You didn't meet your milestone. You know, you would have just stopped, right? <laughs> it's kind of um, so. I, I think I, I think that's you know that's sort of interesting. There's something about cultivating the the right atmosphere, and I'm sure uh, you'll know a lot more about this than I do. But it, it does seem there's this kind of degree of open mindedness, right? Is uh, very important. Yeah, I think so. Um, I wanted to kind of touch on that. Uh, everybody these days is talking about uh, the current richest man in the world, at least according to official reports. And he's quite the uh, the fintech entrepreneur and physicist launching rockets into the into the orbits. Um, do you have any thoughts about um, either Elon Musk or other things that are going on in the world that inspire you and uh, the sort of things that you're interested in? Right. I don't know. The, the latest thing with uh, Musk that I, I thought was kind of funny was like he he sent some tweet about uh is it uh, how do you pronounce it dogecoin or um you know this kind of vague yeah dog i think so kind of doggy coin yeah <laughs> yeah and um and so you know the value went up 15 percent on on the back of that and i just sort of thought this really points towards the kind of the the irrationality of of markets some you know because like if you know, if, 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 apparently that coin was kind of started as a bit of a joke, you know, so you have like, a, you know, a billionaire makes a joke about a currency as a joke and that kind of that goes up, you know, that's like a very valuable joke, right? It went up by, you know, 15% or whatever. Um, and it was, it was a bit like that with, uh, with Bitcoin as well, right? Because, you know, he kind of endorsed Bitcoin and he said that uh, 
the this was like a, an interesting currency and furthermore soon you would be able to buy uh teslas with it and so again it was kind of you know the value of bitcoin went up and so the value of you know tesla went up at, at the same time so it's i think it's really i mean it's fascinating from the point of view of uh testing your ideas about money right to uh, i think it's, you know the, the ultimate lesson is that you can i think we always try to make sense a little bit too much of money. We're, we're kind of uh, try to you know, economists often, you know, there's this, there's this idea that they kind of control the economy, you can control money, you know, modern monetary theory is the idea that we can, you know, create lots of new money. And if it leads to inflation, we'll just throttle it back because we know how to do that. And I, I think, you know, when I see this stuff like this, uh, this happening with people like Musk, I just think like, you know, money is like an amazingly complex dynamic thing you know and it's it's uh it's it's very hard to control or you know and that's what makes it such an interesting subject right i couldn't agree more and, and you know the similar thing happened with gamestop you know he's not a big fan of short sellers and there's a whole debate that you could have around the value that short sellers provide in market efficiency and trying to bring equilibrium to things but uh yeah, really interesting how this stuff uh, pops up into the pop culture and brings some really deep debates to the front of the mind at a time when we have a chance to think about it. Um, David, I could go on all evening, but I want to respect your time. Um, are there any sort of big ideas or final thoughts you'd like to share with our audience at FinTech Plus? Well, just just to um, kind of watch the, the, the quantum space uh, in general, because, um, we could, because I think that it's, it's something that's changing incredibly fast at the moment, you know, like every, every sort of few months or less, you, you hear about major developments. It's going to, it's going to feed into finance probably before it affects other areas. Um, and it's also going to change the way that we think about the economy in general, because these ideas of things like equilibrium and, and rationality and so on that underlie, uh, the mathematical models used are not going to survive contact with a quantum computer. Great. Well, on that note, uh, I hope we get to follow up with some interesting developments uh, later this year or uh, when there's a next major inflection point in economic history. Uh, but until then, all the best with uh, fighting COVID in Toronto. Hope to, hope to be back there myself soon. And uh, thank you again, David. It's been a pleasure. Thanks very much. I enjoyed it. Cheers. Bye-bye.